Thanks very much, Bob. And uh, yeah, it's, it's no secret I'm a big fan of this, uh, this project and the innovations that are coming out of it. But I'd also like to point out that Ofcom as a whole has you know, been listening and watching very closely. And what you've been doing here has and continues to influence the way we approach um, spectrum licensing in particular, to David's point earlier. And in particular, two areas. One is the dynamic uh, sharing of spectrum, where we've got just closed a consultation last week, which many of you replied to. And the other one is actually understanding that uh, in, in rural areas, spectrum is unused and should be offered up. And I think uh, service providers, mo mobile operators realize that that is something they should be looking at because of all the, the headaches that Des pointed out, which are still very, you know, very painful. So we've now proposed that we could act as a facilitator between operators and local communities uh, where that's feasible. And that's one, one of the other areas where we are actually consulting on right now. So your ideas are welcome, and the work you do here is very, very relevant. It has impact, so I just want to make sure you understand that and keep doing it. So first of all, just I've only got 10 minutes, so in this slide there's a lot of, a lot of stuff about innovation, but I'm going to concentrate on the two key areas. I've only got 10 minutes, uh, rural and transport. But first of all, I mean, I could, you know, there's a lot of priorities. Everybody's got a lot of priorities in life. Ofcom, we've got plenty of them as well. But if I was just focus your attention on the first two there, Better broadband and mobile, it's really that simple. Wherever you are, helping to encourage investment, improve coverage right across the country for everybody. That's about universality, and that's what we're here to discuss today and what you're trying to achieve, universality of service. But the second bullet there is equally as important, and it's fairness to customers. And it's a real, I would say, you know, those two things, especially the fairness in particular, is one of the reasons why Ofcom exists. And without that, you know, I don't think we should exist if we're not you know, doing our best to make sure that whatever we do is fair. And a lot of that is commercial issues, pricing, et cetera, but a lot of it is also access to services. So I think you know, the, the main point I want to make today is there are areas where there's a conflict between those two. And the reason why there's a conflict, well, the fact that there's a conflict between universality and fairness is the reason why we don't today have coverage everywhere. Because for all the reasons you've heard today, it's not just about spectrum, it's about the return on investment, it's about the rising cost, and who pays for it. And you know, there, there is a big cost factor here. So <clears throat> while that problem is there, is it fair for everybody around the country to pay for uh, a huge investment of pu public subsidy, for example, in a, in, in a small area of the UK? Those are really pertinent questions. They're not easy to answer. And I'm not saying I've got the answer to them. What I can say is that in many cases, innovation can be the bridge between those two conflicting factors and find the path for us to cross between universality and fairness. And that's what I think this project in particular is focusing on, and that's what I want to, to, to focus on in my presentation. We've got a really cool video now about Paddington Bear, but I'm going to skip it because it's nothing to do with Ruhl, so <laughs> sorry about that. Go on. Sorry. You have, to, you have to ask for an extension if you want to see that. It's really cool. But... <laughs> But, so how can innovation help improve rural coverage? And I think here, so we love all this crazy stuff that you're doing here and you know, we're gonna watch and promote and support all of it and it's, it's, it's in that box there. Emerging tech can reduce cost and extend reach and that's what you're trying to do here. And we will continue to look at ways we can help you, we can support you, we can facilitate, we will listen to what you're saying, we'll observe. And that's a big role of what my team does. Um, and I think, uh, so I'm not going to go through all the innovations that you already know about through this project. I would just like to focus on two or, three th two or three areas and maybe one extra area, which is not on the slide, but I will mention it, where I think, you know, that innovation can really help us to get that balance between universality and, and, and fairness. Um, but before I do that, I think, you know, for me, there's three key words and I'm going to add a fourth key word about solving this issue. It's um, creativity. Courage and collaboration. And this project rule first is about all of those three. The fourth word, can anybody guess the fourth word based on what we just heard from the panel? Another C? Cows. Cows. <laughs> exactly, it's cows, yeah, connected. Community. Communities of cows if you want, but community. And that's the fourth element I want to bring into this. But basically, if you look at the, the bottom box there, this is the advice we gave to government, uh, I think it was about a year before I arrived, actually. But I agree with it. 
which was how do you improve mobile coverage? Now, you could do public subsidy beyond the coverage obligations, obviously, in which we're consulting on, if you want to get to 100%, because at the moment we think it's difficult even with coverage obligations. You could promote more infrastructure sharing and some really great ideas from, from DES this morning and from the Cisco team on how to, how to actually promote lower cost. And further easing of planning barriers and spot on answer to, to David here who, yeah, spectrum is important, but I don't think in this case it's the most difficult thing. It's about, um, you know, can we actually lower the cost to get higher coverage? So all of that is important. We, we touched on rural roaming. I think, it's, um, I think it's important to understand our position on roaming. And uh, we've, we listened also to the operators and to the communities in question. And what's very clear is that um, we don't think that rural, an obligation on rural roaming is the best answer forward. Uh, we are putting in a, an obligation on two coverage uh, uh, obligations for the spectrum uh, auction now. But we don't think roaming obligation would solve the issue because of the competition aspect, and we need to make sure there's fair competition. If you, if you come in heavy-handed there, you remove the incentive to innovate and to invest, and that's not really what we want, is it? However, if there is a common agreement of how to get around that, is there some kind of mechanism where we can make it commercially beneficial for operators to actually roam between, the, uh, between each other, where they can compensate the effort of having a, building a lead on rural coverage the, the, the income they would get from the roaming it doesn't actually pay the effort that's gone into that. So that's a puzzle we can, you know, we are, we're happy to support, but it needs to be a voluntary basis. So we're not ruling it out in the future, but at the moment we think it's probably not the best lever. However, um, localized roaming, um, perhaps enabled by smart contracts, I think is a great idea. So that's something we would definitely support. And there are new mechanisms that can allow us to support roaming between, between operators and local communities, and this is where the community comes in. Can we actually enable that model? And I'll come back to that in a second, but here the three big things here are, first of all, 5G, millimeter wave, beam forming. Yes, we need higher towers, and yes, it is a planning issue, and yes, we're receiving requests, and the government is receiving the requests, and yes, we will have a look at that. But again, you can't, again, you can't oblige people. So apart from you know, giving the permission to build 50 meter towers, many people don't want that. Many people don't want 100 meter towers in their back garden or in, or in these beautiful areas. So we need to find a balance of where it's appropriate, where, there's, you know, where people want that, and where it's an eyesore and would ruin the countryside. So there's a balance to be found there. But the reality is there are literally hundreds of thousand foot towers all over these rural areas. I've counted them. You know, there's quite a lot of them. And believe it or not, those towers are being used by mobile operators. I did the stats on that many years ago. And on average, they're at 30 meters on those towers, of 1,000 foot towers. Why? Does anybody know why? Any guess, Simon? Churches. Churches? Well, there's churches as well, but I'm talking about towers here. So why are people installing a 30 meter instead of 1,000 feet on a, on a tower in a rural area covering a national park? Hmm? The cell planning. The cell planning. So today, in legacy technology, you have to choose how wide is your beam. And the wider it is, the higher you go up, the wider it needs to be the less power, the less coverage, and it gets pretty useless. But with 3D beamforming, which means it automatically checks out every one of you, can send a beam to you, and every time you connect, the beam gets better. Um, and that's totally tailored to you. So that's what 5G beamforming can do in the rural areas. So I really hope that in the next phase of these trials, you put some of that great kit out on these 1,000 foot towers, maybe 900 feet if you want, or 800 feet, and you see what that beamforming can do because it takes away all the pain and the automatic system itself can reach a lot, lot further. That's one of the things we like to see in the, in the national parks in particular where really you will get a lot of, you can put in all the billions you want, but people really don't want to see a lot of 500 meter towers in <coughs> national parks, if there's a better solution. So while in our coverage obligation, we are promoting investment in at least 500 towers, we hope will be built through this, at least. Um, it, they need to go in the places where they are appropriate, but they're not going to get to 100%, and to get to 100% by building more 1,000-foot towers is not going to happen, I think. So that's where innovation can play a role. The other one is device-to-device. -device. We're speaking a lot with the, the community, especially Samsung, who are very active in this, uh, in this world in, in Korea, on 4G device-to-device. -device. Device. What this means is you hop from one phone to another phone and then back to the network. This exists in Tetra, in emergency services. It's in the 3GPP standards for 4G, and Samsung has got a version that's working now, and it's already being planned into the 5G um, specs for release 17 in particular. 
for what they call extreme coverage, yeah, which is rural, obviously. So that technology, let's go and test it out in Scotland. Let's do it here. And you know, it might not work everywhere, but you could test it out in a national park where you've got an enclosed area and with the right handsets you can hop along and, and back to the network rather than build a massive tower because you only need it, it's coverage on demand. You only need it when there's people there. And especially for the agri-tech industry, so all those IoT and the tractors, etc., hopping from one tractor to another tractor and back into the farmer's uh, head office is absolutely doable and it's absolutely, there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. Let's go and do and innovate on that. The final area is, uh, is LEO, LEO satellites. We had a look at this for the USO, Universal Service Obligation. It wasn't quite there. I would just say, wow, this place, this area is moving so fast, so fast, that you are going to have a bit of a shock. So you need to keep an eye on that. So can they actually get there um, based on the current plans? I'm not sure. There's more than one company out there. There's several of them out there. They're all vying for it. Wales is in their first kind of reach area. Scotland is just outside, but if the government can convince some of these people to put up a few more satellites a bit northern, it costs a lot of money, but that's an area that we have to keep an eye on. So all of those areas can come in, come in well. Those are three. The fourth one is the community one. I was just reading now our report on community radio. So can anybody, so we know that we have community radio stations being licensed all around the country. Not enough in Scotland. I think there's only a small, about 15 I saw in Scotland. These are analog community radio stations. Anybody know how many there are? at the moment? 279 today, and there's 42. We have our fourth round of licenses coming now. There's going to be another 42. That's 300. On radio, they're five kilometers. So um, I think if... So five kilometers is, is good enough, but imagine if, if they were also providing cellular coverage. Uh, that could be a 10 kilometer radius. That's 300 by you know, 100 square kilometers. That's 30,000 square kilometers. That could be just covered alone. Now, why is that important? Because now... As we go over the, the analog, we're moving to digital. So the next round is going to be about DAB, digital audio broadcasting. And there's a huge opportunity there just to build on that, to plug in a radio module, one of the, one of the stuff that you have out there in the Orkneys, plug it in there, and get, get down to the, to the bottom line is really cost. Because as you know, the Scottish Futures Trust, I saw Derek here somewhere. Is Derek here? Well, we have Harry here from the Scottish Government. Even when you put in the public subsidy and you build the capex and you build, you offer the equipment free of charge, the OPEX alone, you know, running that base station once you built it, is enough to kill any business model today. Now, maybe in the future, maybe not, but today, yes. So lowering that cost, you need to build on what's out there. So if there are hundreds of communities actually designing and building their own radio base stations, putting in an extra you know, antenna or just an amplifier in some cases on top of their existing infrastructure, could be a way to actually offer a lower cost alternative to operators. And in that context, why would an operator go and build their own towers when they could actually interwork with a community provider? And that's where we can come in as a facilitator. So I'd really invite you also to look into, into that area. I'll skip the, the, the uh, industry, I'll skip the slicing. You've heard this one before. Just a quick one on the roads and, and railways. This is another area where we can really do something tremendous. There's a lot of, I mean, I think, We've kind of fallen over and failed so many times on this one that there's finally appetite to step back a bit and say, well, what are we trying to achieve here? Can we be more holistic? So I just want to point out one thing here. Dynamic spectrum sharing. And I know David, David's going to talk about this. I have one request. I hear so much about dynamic spectrum sharing, and I think it's great, and we love it. But you know, for it to be really useful, you need to understand why does it need to be dynamic and how dynamic does it need to be? I draw your attention to, to the bottom bullets there, optimal use of resources, programmable networks, dynamic allocation of resources, power, bandwidth, capacity. So where is, the, where is there anywhere better than something that's moving to put dynamic spectrum sharing? So a railway, where you have lots of passengers on a train that's moving, could, isn't it a fantastic use of dynamic spectrum sharing to have your spectrum following that train across Scotland? Or following a road, following the people? So we really invite you to look at those big pictures and see where the innovations are most appropriate. And you can start with that, and then it might spread out to other areas. But I think you know, we're really interested in seeing how dynamic spectrum sharing can be applied to dynamic users uh, in particular. Just a quick, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah. So just very quick on the recent activity that we're doing. So that was kind of the, uh, the big pictures. Here's just a summary of a lot of stuff we're doing. Um, <laughs> to actually support universality and innovation right across. So you'll see there's a lot of consultations. We're just, we had uh, over 60 responses to our 
consultation on spectrum sharing. So thank you very much for that. That's a, that's a great result. Great to see so much interest. Uh, the USO, obviously, is also going to kick off. And one of the things we're trying to understand is how can we make best? So the USO is for broadband, fixed broadband, 10 megabits per second minimum. We're consulting on awarding that uh, by summer. we will start service next year. And as part of that, it's really interesting to see how can the USO and things like the R100, et cetera, fit together in a, in a coherent way to solve this problem once and for all for, for mobile coverage as well. And with that, I think I'll close there. Is that right? Time up? Good. Thank you very much.